Well, good evening and welcome to the latest in this series of Treasurer's Lectures. I'm standing in this evening for Master Treasurer as she is in Pakistan where she herself is delivering a lecture. It's a particular pleasure to welcome as our lecturer this evening one of our own, Master Jonathan Jones, Sir Jonathan Jones, King's Council. Master Jones has had an immensely distinguished career in the government legal service where he has successively been legal advisor to the Department of Education, Director General of the Attorney General's Office, Deputy Treasury Solicitor, and Director General of the Home Office Legal Advisors Branch. In 2014, he was appointed Treasury Solicitor and Permanent Secretary to the Government Legal Department in succession to another Middle Templar, Sir Paul Jenkins. And Master Jones held those offices until his resignation in September 2020. He's now a consultant with Linklaters. During his time as Treasury Solicitor, he overcame unprecedented challenges in quite extraordinary times. I was privileged to work with him on a joint working group on withdrawal from the European Union, where his legal expertise and his good judgment were much in evidence. Master Jones also has a well-deserved reputation for speaking truth to power. The subject this evening is public law and the constitution under a Sunak government. Uh, he tells me he will explore recent and possible future developments in public and constitutional law, including judicial review, human rights, and rule of law, and the implications of the change of prime minister and government. We greatly look forward to his lecture. Thank you very much, Master Lloyd Jones. I hope we can do something about the sound. Right, you can now hear me, uh, so I'll carry on. Um, thank you very much for coming. Uh, thank you in her absence to Master Treasurer for inviting me to give this talk. Um, as such is the, is the turbulence of our political and constitutional life at the moment that the title I originally gave, which was Public Law and the Constitution under a Trust Government, was out of date uh, almost as soon as I'd suggested it. Um, and there is every chance that anything I say in the course of this lecture will also be out of date by the time I finish. Um, so where do I start? I'm actually going to start with the 2019 Tory party manifesto, which does admittedly feel like a work of ancient history, given how much has happened since 2019. We've had obviously the UK's departure from the EU, the COVID pandemic, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. We've seen the death of Queen Elizabeth and the accession of King Charles with a wealth of impressive ceremonial and solemnity and plenty for constitutional geeks to pour over, uh, including the Accession Council, which is, I thought, a peculiarly British combination of arcane ceremony, uh, some genuine, if niche, legal business, uh, a touchy incident with a leaky pen, um, all broadcast and streamed live around the world, the first time any outsider had seen a Privy Council meeting at all. So that strange combination of antiquity and ceremonial and innovation that characterizes perhaps quite a lot of our constitution. And of course, we've had two changes of prime minister. Maybe 22 will become known as the year of the three prime ministers, assuming Mr. Sunak can hold on for a couple more months. But there's nothing unconstitutional in that. Uh, under our constitution, we elect MPs, not governments or prime ministers. There are no relevant legal or constitutional rules on how political parties choose their leaders or how often they change them, um, but it certainly hasn't made for stability or good governance. But still, despite the passage of time and all that change, Rishi Sunak has pledged up to a point to respect the 2019 manifesto, he described it in his first speech as Prime Minister as the mandate that belongs to and unites all of us. And he's committed to deliver on it. 
And I should say that that use of deliver to mean do something is one of my pet hates. So uh, if you ever catch me using it, uh, shoot me. I accept when I'm quoting somebody else. Um, but anyway, I think that means we are entitled to look at the 2019 manifesto, even if only as a historical artifact. Uh, and for our purposes this evening, the manifesto promised to protect our democracy. And it contains some commitments which have already been met, including, sorry, to deliver Brexit, which has met, been met at least in the sense that we have left the EU, uh, to repeal the Fixed Term Parliaments Act and to legislate for voter ID. There was a commitment to establish a constitution, democracy and rights commission in the first year of the government. And that certainly didn't happen, although there were reviews of administrative law and of the Human Rights Act, which I'll come back to. And there were other commitments which are work in progress or remain open to end the supremacy of European law, to look at the relationship between government, parliament and the courts, and in particular to update the Human Rights Act and administrative law to ensure that there is a proper balance between the rights of individuals, our vital national security and effective government. And again, I'll come back to all of those things. So that's what the manifesto said. What then should we expect from the Sunak government? And I'm going to look at these areas. First of all, the union, United Kingdom, in particular, the prospects for Scottish independence. Secondly, what next after Brexit? Thirdly, human rights, fourth judicial review, and finally, standards and ethics. And that's my personal selection of constitutional public law topics. First of all, the union. Uh, the Economist observed recently that outsiders watching Britain in recent years might have toyed with a gloomy calculation which would survive longer, the ancient Conservative and Unionist Party or the even older United Kingdom that it governs. As we all know, the Scots voted against independence in 2014 in a ballot sanctioned by, by the British government and the Westminster Parliament. The SNP, of course, wants another referendum. The legal issue, which I'll come on to in a second, is the Scotland Act 1998, which stipulates that the union of England and Scotland is a matter reserved for the Westminster Parliament. And so the position of the uh, British government is that no referendum can take place without Westminster's consent. And Rishi Sunak is unlikely to provide it. He said he wants to be the guardian of the union. He's promised to do anything and everything to protect, sustain and strengthen it. Uh, like his predecessors, he opposes a second Scottish independence referendum, uh, describing it as a quite frankly balmy idea. Um, his predecessor, Liz Truss, who might have been the subject of this lecture, uh, said that her approach to dealing with Nicola Sturgeon was to ignore her. But Ms. Truss wasn't really around in office for long enough to tell. Um, and Mr. Sunak has said he thinks that approach is dangerously complacent. He wants to take on Nicola Sturgeon and win the argument. And whether there is a legal route through that impasse will depend on what the, at least in part, on what the Supreme Court decides in the case referred to it by the Lord Advocate, which was heard last month. And that reference concerns a proposed bill of the Scottish Parliament to authorise a second referendum. Um, and the Supreme Court has to decide two issues. First of all, whether it has jurisdiction to consider the reference at all, or whether the reference is impermissible because it's essentially a hypothetical request for an advisory opinion on what is merely a draft or proposed bill. And secondly, if the reference is valid, whether the bill is outside the competence of the Scottish Parliament because it relates to aspects of the constitution, as I've said, in particular, the union of the kingdoms of Scotland and England. And I won't, with Master Lloyd-Jones sitting next to me, speculate on the outcome of that case. Um, the UK government, through the Advocate General for Scotland, has unsurprisingly argued that the reference is invalid and that the proposed bill is outside the competence of the Scottish Parliament. The Lord Advocate uh, for the Scottish government 
well, she, I couldn't quite make up her mind on the substantive question, which is really why she's asked the Supreme Court to decide it. Um, but I'd add only that even if the Supreme Court rules that the bill is within competence, it would at least in theory be open to the Westminster Parliament to reverse that outcome just by readjusting the devolution settlement or do some of the other things which have been previously floated. Um, for example, legislate to require a given proportion of MSPs to vote for the bill or raising the threshold for a yes vote in any referendum. Um, so suffice it to say there is as yet no clear legal or constitutional route to a second referendum in Scotland, let alone independence. Second theme, what next after Brexit? Um, well, we've left the EU. Mr. Sunak backed leave uh, in the 2016 referendum. He described it as, as a decision that would result in the United Kingdom being freer, fairer, and more prosperous outside the EU. So I won't comment on whether he's right about that or not, but there are certainly some items of unfinished business. Uh, and the first one I will focus on is the retained EU law revocation and reform bill. So the question there is what happens to all the former EU law, which was brought onto the British statute book when we, when we left. I say the British statute book, I do realize there are different legal systems in the UK, but forgive my shorthand. Um, so it was recognized that we would need some way of carrying forward that large body of EU law, which had become part of our domestic law during the period of our membership, if we were to avoid major gaps and uncertainty in the law when we left. And Parliament therefore passed the EU Withdrawal Act 2018, which created the concept of retained EU law. And that provided, in very brief summary, that EU law, as it had effect in the EU at the end of the transition period was to continue as part of UK national law and was to continue to be interpreted in the same way as previously in accordance with EU principles and case law. At the same time it was recognised that some retained EU law would need to be adapted so as to work once the UK had left the EU to reflect the fact that we were no longer a member state of a third country to remove or change references to the EU institutions and some of the other EU flavored terminology and simply ensure that the law worked technically after we left. So the 2018 Act contained a power for ministers to make regulations to deal with what were called deficiencies in retained EU law uh, to make necessary technical and terminological changes. Uh, and many hundreds of sets of regulations were, were made to do that. Uh, the aim overall though was to make the minimal minimum changes necessary for the law to work, but otherwise to secure as much legal certainty and predictability and continuity as possible, and therefore minimal legal disruption at any rate to businesses and consumers and other every user of the law. And by and large, I think that was achieved. And now we've left the EU, obviously Parliament can change any aspect of retained EU law at once, the normal way of doing that would be for the government to bring forward a bill on any particular policy area. It might even consult on it and members of both houses would debate it and be able to table amendments to it. And when enacted, it would become law. The relevant retained EU law would be changed and the courts would give effect to that. But the retained EU law revocation and reform bill introduced in Parliament in September takes a very different approach. Instead, it asks Parliament to take the whole block of retained EU law in one go. The explanatory notes to the bill say this amounts to over 2,400 pieces of retained EU law. It provides that all of this automatically expires at the end of 2023, although that deadline can itself be extended for particular pieces of legislation, unless ministers decide otherwise. It changes the way in which retained EU law is to be interpreted and it gives very wide powers for ministers to decide whether some is kept, to amend it or to replace it. 
Uh, so in short, it's a bonfire of EU laws by the end of 23, 2023, unless ministers decide something else. And the consequence is that neither Parliament in considering the bill, nor businesses, nor anybody else, can know what the law will be by the end of 2023 in any area currently covered by retained EU law, which of course spans much of the statute book and, and the, as I've said, the whole period of our membership of the EU. All of this is left up to ministers to decide with minimal further scrutiny by Parliament. No scrutiny at all if ministers do nothing and simply let the legislation expire automatically on the sunset date. Uh, this is a recipe for huge legal uncertainty with all the implications that has for business confidence and decisions about investment. Uh, and this, I would say, is nothing to do with the merits of Brexit. This is about how we legislate for ourselves in this country. The bill is currently going through Parliament. I hope the new government has second thoughts about it. Um, Rishi Sunak originally promised he promised to create a Brexit delivery department, which would do more or less what this bill is trying to do, to recommend very quickly whether to scrap or reform all of these 2,400 pieces of retained EU law. He promised to do it within 100 days of taking up his job. Um, I think he may have changed his mind on that, uh, and that, that pledge is being shelved in the wake of many, many warnings, not just from lawyers, but from businesses and indeed from within the civil service as to how much work will be involved in trying to analyze and assess all these pieces of law within little more than a year. So we'll have to see. Uh, the second bit of unfinished post-Brexit business uh, that I want to touch on is the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, the government's been trying to get, get out of the Northern Ireland Protocol almost ever since it signed it as part of the EU withdrawal agreement in January 2020. It attempted to make changes to it in the 2020 Internal Market Bill, which the then is all very well trodden, well, particularly for me, very well trodden territory. The then Northern Ireland Secretary accepted that this would involve committing limited and specific breaches of the UK's international obligations and in the end, those provisions were withdrawn after a bit of a fuss and my resignation as Treasury Solicitor. But the current Northern Ireland Protocol Bill goes much further than the Internal Market Bill a couple of years ago. It, it the new bill, overrides or empowers ministers to override almost every aspect of the protocol, confers extremely wide powers on ministers. The Hansard Society has described them as breathtaking powers. Uh, if you lost your breath every time you saw a bill conferring very wide powers on ministers, you would die of asphyxiation, I think. Um, I think that's a point made um, by Master Judge in a recent speech here about the scope of the widening scope of executive powers. Uh, and the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill is certainly a very uh, extreme example of that. It confers powers on ministers to make whatever provision they consider appropriate including provisions breaching the protocol, amending prim primary legislation, even the bill itself, is the so-called super Henry VIII powers. Um, so that's the structure of the bill. Um, the government's justification for it um, bears a bit of attention. The protocol, as part of the withdrawal agreement, is binding on the United Kingdom under international law. The government has argued that the bill is nonetheless consistent with the UK's international law obligations on the basis of the concept of necessity, that the bill is the only way of alleviating socio-economic conditions, giving rise to a grave and imminent peril to the UK's essential interests. That's the test. I think this justification is hopeless on every level. The test of necessity for breaking the binding treaty obligation is a very high one. The government's given no evidence to show how it is met, nor is there any explanation for why legislation on the scale of the bill is necessary. Again, that being the test, why it is necessary to deal with the situation. 
and why lesser measures have not been attempted first, including, controversial though this might be, Article 16 of the protocol, which itself allows either the EU or the UK to take safeguard measures uh, in the case of serious economic, societal difficulties and so on. Um, but that route has not been taken. Instead, the government has resorted straight away uh, to this very extreme bill. And if the protocol really did represent a grave and imminent threat to the UK back in June, when the bill was published, you might think that the government would have had to do something about it rather more urgently than waiting for a bill to trundle through Parliament some five months later. So in my view, there are two serious problems with the bill. First, that it will inevitably breach international law. And second, that it is fundamentally undemocratic in the scope of the powers it confers on ministers, including powers to break international law with minimal parliamentary oversight. I also struggle to see how it can solve the problem of the North, uh, so to speak, of the Northern Ireland Protocol. On the contrary, it can only damage relations with the EU and risk provoking infringement or retaliatory action. Uh, so once again, we have to see what approach Mr. Sunak and his new government will take. He said to favour a negotiated solution with the EU over the protocol. That is, of course, how you would normally make changes to a binding agreement. Uh, but he may equally, as some others have done, see the bill as a kind of useful threat or a weapon to keep in reserve. Uh, if so, I think that is very damaging. But we will see. Third topic, human rights. Every Conservative government manifesto over the last 12 years has included in some form a commitment to review, replace or scrap the Human Rights Act 1998. Um, not the 2019 manifesto, which I mentioned, committed to updating it. So in 2020, the then Justice Secretary and Lord Chancellor Sir Robert Buckland launched an independent review of the Human Rights Act led by Sir Peter Gross. And the review reported in December 2021, recommending only modest changes to the Act and various non-legislative measures to, for example, to improve education in the field of human rights and improve dialogue between the UK and the Council of Europe. By that time, though, Dominic Raab had swung through the revolving door at the Ministry of Justice and he had other plans. Um, Mr. Raab promised the Conservative Party that he would overhaul the Human Rights Act and then launched a new consultation which promised much more radical reform uh, in the form of a Bill of Rights bill. Uh, Sir Peter Gross has said that he did not regard this as a response to his review, uh, which seems to have been largely ignored in truth by the MOJ proposal, by the Raab proposals. Uh, the same goes as far as I can see, uh, for the responses that the MOJ received to that consultation, many of which raised concerns about the Bill of Rights Bill, but the government pressed ahead anyway. Um, and Mr. Raab's draft Bill of Rights Bill, that is of course what it's called, uh, on the basis that when enacted, it would become a Bill of Rights 2023, say, uh, he ignored calls for pre-legislative scrutiny of that bill. It would, in summary, repeal and supplant the Human Rights Act. It envisages the UK remaining party to the European Convention on Human Rights. I'll come back to that. So the rights covered by the bill are the same convention rights as the Human Rights Act. And talk of adding special British flavoured rights has come to nothing. Clause 9 on the right to a jury trial creates no such new right. It simply says you can have a jury trial unless the law says you can't. Um, but although the set of rights remains the same, the bill makes major changes to the way in which they are to be applied and interpreted and enforced. So, First of all, claimants will now need to get permission to bring a human rights claim, requiring them to prove they have suffered significant disadvantage. Secondly, Crucially, the bill omits Section 3 of the Human Rights Act, which is the provision requiring 
domestic courts to interpret domestic legislation in a manner compatible with the convention rights so far as possible. Uh, third, uh, the bill directs UK courts um, in various ways to take a more restrictive interpretation of particular rights and makes them less likely to find that legislation violates the convention. Thus, for example, the courts must give the greatest possible weight, whatever that means, to the decisions of Parliament in balancing competing factors. The courts must not interpret convention rights in a way which imposes new positive obligations on public authorities, and they are to take a highly restrictive interpretation of Article 8 on right to respect for private and family life in deportation cases. Um, it's a very restrictive test, which I won't go into. Um, so this bill has, has been heavily criticised, not least by Lord Mance, uh, in a recent, I think um, Joshua Rosenberg described it as an evisceration of the bill, uh, criticising not least its complexity, but also observing that it would risk undermining what used to be the accepted and successful object of the Human Rights Act, which was to bring rights home. So Robert Buckland, uh, who had pre previously been Lord Chancellor and, and introduced the original review of the Human Rights Act, has described the Bill of Rights Bill as a cure in search of a problem. In other words, it goes much wider than any kind of problem that it was designed to solve. Uh, and many other politicians and others have criticised it. Um, so it's a, it's a fiendishly complicated piece of legislation. It will certainly provide work for lawyers, but it is difficult to see it as an enhancement of human rights protection. It can only make it harder to bring human rights claims in the UK court. I think that is the point of it. Uh, and make it less likely that such claims will succeed. Instead, it may perversely lead to more claimants taking their cases to the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, with all the cost and inconvenience that will entail, if they can afford it. And this potentially sets up conflict between the UK and the ECHR. If such claims succeed in the Strasbourg Court, uh, the government will either have to comply, which presumably, potentially undermines the whole point of the bill, or defy them, thus putting the UK in breach of its international law obligations under the convention. So the bill deliberately, I think, sets up or exacerbates that conflict. Um, it was temporarily shelved under Liz Truss, um, with one Whitehall source quoted as saying, it is unlikely to progress in its current form. Um, and Brandon Lewis, in his fleeting term as Lord Chancellor, said he was looking at the Bill of Rights to ensure that we, I'm sorry he said this, we, we deliver on the government's objectives in the best way possible. Uh, but now Dominic Raab is back in the job. He has said the bill will return to Parliament in the coming weeks. Um, I assume supported by Mr Sunak, who during his leadership campaign described human rights law as a problem in this country. So it's difficult to avoid the conclusion that the Bill of Rights is not about protecting individual rights at all, but about making it easier for the government to breach them. Indeed, there are calls to go further. So Suella Braverman, of course, formerly uh, Attorney General, then Home Secretary, then not, and then Home Secretary again. But anyway, she's made clear that if it were up to, up to her, the UK would leave the ECHR altogether. And Mr. Sunak, when asked about that, said all options are on the table. Um, that would obviously be a huge step. Uh, one can hardly go into the implications here. Um, but among other things, such a move would certainly risk putting the UK in breach of the Good Friday Agreement, uh, which requires the maintenance of safeguards human rights safeguards, including the ECHR and the incorporation of the Convention into Northern Ireland law with direct access to the courts and remedies for breach of the Convention. So um, there's a problem lurking there, uh, but at the moment, as far as I know, it is still government policy to um, remain party to the Convention, uh, and that of course gives rise to the problems with the Bill of Rights Bill that I've mentioned. <laughs>
Fourth area, judicial review. In my previous life as a government lawyer, I uh, acted for governments of all political colors. And most of the time, ministers don't positively welcome their decision being challenged or overturned. Mostly though, in my experience, they accept it as a necessary evil, perhaps, however, grudgingly, as an essential aspect of the rule of law, and even possibly as an incentive towards better decision making. The rhetoric from this government and its immediate predecessors has, however, been much sharper. It's included heavy criticism of lawyers for doing their jobs and having the temerity to act for clients who want to enforce their rights or challenge government decisions. Ministers, in particular, Suella Braverman and Dominic Raab, both of course now backing government, have also criticized the tendency of the courts to intervene in what they regard as policy issues. I won't go into them now. There's a kind of um, notorious four or five cases that ministers have always quoted, including the two Miller cases on the requirement for legislation to start the Article 50 Brexit process, on proroguing Parliament, the Privacy International case is on the reviewability of um, decisions of the Investigative Powers Tribunal, and the Evans case, it feels like ancient history now, but Evans still gets trotted out. This is about the application of the uh, Freedom of Information Act and the scope of the ministerial veto uh, in relation to uh, then the Prince of Wales' letters. Um, government really hated all those cases uh, and still does. And they are used as an example of the courts going too far as failing to pay, pay sufficient regard to the sovereignty of parliament and as uh, the courts impermissibly trespassing onto matters of policy. I don't think that's an unfair summary of the critique. Um, anyway, so the view was taken that uh, judicial review, this role of the courts in scrutinizing government decisions needed to be reined in. And again, it was then Robert Buckland, then Lord Chancellor, who launched an independent review of administrative law led by Lord Fawkes, Master Fawkes, Edward Fawkes, to examine trends in judicial review and deliberate on recommendations on reform. And that review, published in March of last year, um, again gave rather a positive health report on the state of judicial review. It recognized the vital role that JR plays in ensuring that government and other public bodies act within the law. It did not support the idea that there had been significant overreach or a surge in cases in recent years, or that large numbers of un unmeritorious cases are being allowed to succeed. Instead, it recommended, again, only modest changes, um, including removing the right to review in a particular category of immigration case, cart cases. Um, but this didn't seem to go far enough for the government. So uh, the then Lord Chancellor launched another consultation, which put forward a number of further proposals for reform, including, in my view, problematic proposals for ouster clauses that would have excluded the court's review jurisdiction altogether or severely restricted it in particular cases. In the event, what followed, what is now the Judicial Review and Courts Act 2022, does no more than adopt the Fawkes Review recommendation on cart cases and include a power for courts to postpone or limit the retrospective effect of any quashing order. In that respect, it, it adds to, actually it adds to, rather than reducing the powers of the courts. You might think that's a slightly odd outcome for uh, an exercise that was originally designed to rein the courts in, but it may not be the end of the story. Uh, we had a leaked report earlier this year that Dominic Raab was planning to consult on further reforms about intensity of review, possibly on standing um, and possibly on costs. Um, so again, we will have to wait and see whether the government, this government returns to that charge. Some have already detected a shift in the approach of the courts, whether in response to those ministerial criticisms I've mentioned, or as part of the normal ebb and flow in jurisprudence, or perhaps indeed as a result of changes in personnel among the higher judiciary. 
Um, again, I won't run through all these cases, but um, there are examples of the courts deliberately referring to um, and, and paying express respect to the, the role of parliament in deciding policy and the courts not going behind that. Um, and there have also been developments in the law on standing uh, in the Good Law Project and the Running Mead Trust case, um, which was a challenge to the government, to government appointments to the COVID task force. The High Court looked closely at the tests on standing and in particular concluded that the Good Law Project, which many of you will have heard of, um, cannot be assumed to have standing, can, cannot be assumed to have carte blanche to bring any claim. Um, so we'll have to see again how far that is a trend. Um, but there certainly have been some cases that, to put it crudely, have gone the government's way uh, when it comes to um, both the test for JR and the approach to standing. Um, but we've continued to see quite a lot of rhetoric in that space. Again, during his first leadership campaign, Mr Sunak promised he would crack down on lawfare and campaigning groups that are politicising our courts wasting time and taxpayers' money, here we go, I just have a klaxon, slowing down government delivery. And he said he would put in place, it's a bit mysterious this, a draft civil procedure amendment rules order, which, would, which he would activate in the event of what he described as judicial recidivism. Looking at all the judges in this room, I hope you're listening. Anyway, I don't think he has laid that order. Um, so we will have to see whether he meant it. Um, he's also said he wants to improve the government's accountability. Um, and we'll have to see how far he really means that and whether he includes in that uh, accountability to the courts. My final topic, just about, okay, on time. Standards and ethics. What finally brought down Boris Johnson was his failure to play by the rules, even though he was supposed to be their guardian. In the ministerial code, which he issued on becoming prime minister in 2019, he said this, we must uphold the very highest standards of propriety. There must be no bullying and no harassment, no leaking, no breach of collective responsibility, no misuse of taxpayer money, and so on. The precious principles of public life integrity, ob objectivity, accountability, transparency, honesty, and leadership in the public interest must be honored at all times, as must the political impartiality of our much admired civil service. But by the time Boris Johnson resigned as prime minister, that all felt rather hollow. The ministerial code was a dead letter. He'd failed to take action on findings, for example, at Pretty Patel, was guilty of bullying, two independent advisors on the code had resigned, and Johnson had failed to appoint a, replace, a replacement. He himself is now subject to an investigation by the Commons Privileges Committee for having misled Parliament. Liz Truss wasn't in office long enough to issue a new ministerial code. Rishi Sunak hasn't done so yet, but in his first speech as Prime Minister, I've mentioned this, he promised to lead the UK with integrity professionalism and accountability. Now that commitment was very quickly called into question by his reappointment of Suella Braverman as Home Secretary only days after she had resigned for failing in her own language to meet the highest standards to which she held herself. And now, to put it no higher, questions are circling around the conduct of Sir Gavin Williamson who Mr. Sunak also reappointed. But if he's serious about high standards of integrity, on which so much else depends, the quality of governance and decision-making, trust between politicians and the public and between ministers and the civil service. If he's serious about those things, he will need to do more than talk about them. He will certainly need to issue a new ministerial code. He will also need to appoint a new independence ethics advisor, which he said he would do, uh, and show that he heeds their advice. The Independent Committee on Standards in Public Life, among others, have gone further and recommended that the code be put on a statutory footing 
and the independent advisor be given legal powers to initiate investigations. At the moment, he simply can investigate what the prime minister asks him or her, when there is one, to investigate uh, and to make findings to determine breaches of the code. Yet again, we will have to see whether the new prime minister is prepared to back up his words with actions like that. And finally, finally, while we're on the subject of the civil service and independent advice, against a background of negative briefings from ministers about civil servants being well, risk averse, maniacs, blockers of policy, work shy idlers who don't come to work, all of this been floating around. Um, the trust government sacking of Tom Scholar, the senior official in the Treasury, the failure to publish OBR advice, and so on. Um, the allegation now that the Home Secretary is ignoring legal advice. The new Prime Minister will have some work to do to restore morale and provide reassurance that he really does value the civil service, its integrity and professionalism. Uh, his decision to, to scrap the target of 91,000 jobs and to reverse the decision cancelling um, reverse the decision cancelling the fast stream um, that will have helped. So my conclusion, final final conclusion, um, this government and its immediate predecessors seem to have an uneasy relationship with the constitutional and institutional and legal framework within which they work. They think the courts have gone too far and should back off from intervening in government decision making. They don't like activist or lefty lawyers challenging their actions. They don't much like the Human Rights Act. They've been prepared to break international law. They've become increasingly addicted to taking very wide powers to legislate with minimal parliamentary scrutiny. They've had at times a confrontational attitude to the civil service and to various independent bodies and have been suspicious of their advice. And the machinery for enforcing ethical standards in government has been severely weakened. We've seen some changes of tone and emphasis from the new Sunak government. I'm not expecting any of these issues to go away, but we'll have to see what he does about any of them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Master Jones has very kindly agreed to answer some questions at this point. Jonathan. It should be a microphone. Do we have a microphone? There's one on its way. Thank you. I'd like to ask you about the Bill of Rights Bill. And, and based on your experience in government, albeit at a time when things were rather calmer than they are now, I'd like you to perhaps tell us, to speculate on what would be going on within government on this bill. As you said, Dominic Raab told us at the weekend that the bill would be going ahead in the coming weeks, which I presume means second reading debate in the Commons. But what needs to happen between now and then for the bill to go ahead in this way? Do we infer from the fact that he spoke to the Sunday Telegraph and put this out on Twitter over the weekend that he has got the support of the Prime Minister? Does it have to go through any committees to decide which bills are going to take up parliamentary time? Is he perhaps bouncing the Prime Minister into something that the Prime Minister may not necessarily have agreed to? If the bill is going ahead, will it go ahead in the form in which it was published? Or might the bill be pruned, as uh, Liz Truss's government suggested? And what are its prospects of getting through the House of Lords, um, given, and, and is it correct to say that given that the manifesto which you referred to uh, says reform and what the bill does is repeal and replacement, that there may not be 
the House of Lords may take the view it doesn't have to um, uh, comply with the convention that the government's manifesto goes through. So it's really what are the processes to get this bill into law between now and the next election and the chances of that happening? Well, I think we uh, many of us had hoped, indeed we were assured, that the bill was being paused in that brief moment when Liz Truss was Prime Minister. Um, but it was no surprise to me that it's resurfaced under Dominic Raab because this is very much his, I don't wish to be gratuitously rude, this is very much his vanity project. Uh, and it has been uh, a theme of the project of his, I mean, wh when I was um, Treasury Solicitor, he was a junior minister at MOJ, he was working on it then. Um, so it's no surprise that it's come forward again. And I mean, I assume he will have, he will be confident that he has got the backing of number 10, not least given some of the things that um, Richie Sunak has said during the various leadership campaigns and so on. And I'm assuming he will have the backing of Suella Braverman uh, at the Home Office, even though it may well be that she wishes we could go further. Nonetheless, you know, she's up for Human Rights Act reform. So um, my guess is he will feel now he's got sufficient support within government for it. I don't, by the way, know what the new Attorney General Victoria Prentice thinks of this bill. Um, but let's assume that he feels he's got support for it. Um, the, the background for it now will, of course, will in part be this sort of continuing agony around Rwanda and the, 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 the sort of cycle that the government is, uh, is in around what they do about immigrants and asylum seekers, and that there's some solution out there which would enable people to be either detained or removed which will open up if only we could get out of the, um, the constraints of this wretched act in this convention. Now, I suspect some people do still think that. Um, and this bill is not a way of doing that, as we've said, because uh, the convention rights remain the same, by and large. There is this convoluted test that has, has been met in um, devolution cases, it's in, in deportation cases, but it's certainly not one bound and we're free of the convention. And it may be that there are some in government who simply don't understand that and think that this is a route which will provide a solution to those problems which are just as acute now as they've ever been. So that, I suspect that's part of the political background. We've got to be seen to do something to help us find out to, to, to find a way out of this immigration impasse. Um, well, you know, the government has a majority in the Commons, so, you know, one normally expects it to get its business through. Um, I would expect this bill to be thoroughly trashed in the Lords. Um, and then you're into the same kind of pattern that we've seen, that we're seeing with the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, with the, virtually all the other things I've mentioned, the retained EU law bill, where the, where the Lords do their worst or their best. And then we've never quite reached the point where, yet if we haven't reached the point in time, where you have the showdown and the Lords has to decide when it backs down and the government has to decide how much it gives in. And there are always things you can, you can concede on a bill as complicated as this. There are some procedural things you can concede, for example, around the scope of the power and the level of parliamentary scrutiny. You could get rid of some of the, the, the Henry VIII type elements of the powers. Um, but beyond that, Joshua, it's very difficult to speculate, but I'm assuming this now has, has at least some political head of steam before it, so, it will, so that's the process it will now go through. Yes, in the third row. Right. Uh, thank you. So you resigned from government over breaking international law, particularly the uh, Northern Ireland Protocol. So my question is therefore, what do you make of the Sunak, Sunak government's commitment to international law Generally, I'm thinking particularly in the last few days, I think it might have been yesterday, the, um, the government, the, the Foreign Office in particular, said it would be happy to negotiate with Mauritius over the Chagos Islands dispute and was, the reason was to show its commitment to international law over the Russian uh, U Ukraine war and to, to set an example. So I want to see, obviously it's very recent, but whether that's a good sign or whether it, it matters or your opinions on that. Thank you. So I, all governments say they respect international law and the rule of law. Um, 
and this government has said it, uh, and there will be there are plenty of people in the Foreign Office, certainly, who, you know, for whom it's absolutely in their bloodstream. Um, unfortunately, the government has got into a particular problem with the protocol, uh, which, uh, as I've said, it's regretted almost from the moment it signed it. Um, and that is partly because, largely because, um, it lied about what the protocol did and didn't do, and um, led people, including the DUP, to believe a, a set of things about the deal that would be reached. For example, that there would be no checks between Great Britain and Northern Ireland in the movement of goods, and the protocol envisaged that there would. Um, and the government has therefore ever since been stuck between those two positions um, and has been trying to find a way of reconciling them, which, I mean, ultimately it's impossible to reconcile them, but there are ways you can ameliorate them, but they are ways that have to be negotiated. Uh, and that, as I've said, is how, however arduous that may be, that is how you get changes to, well, any contract, but in particular, an international agreement, you negotiate changes. Um, and the, Sunak has said he's prepared to do that. But for whatever reason, this has become such a kind of chochemic, problematic issue because of the continued assurances and promises that are given, each time raising the kind of stakes. And that therefore this bill, this very, very extreme bill, is say basically providing for the whole of the protocol to be set aside and in the process, giving very, very wide powers to ministers to decide how. Um, is now regarded is almost regarded now as a minimum by the DUP and others. You know, we've got to achieve that. That will be a start. And so you've got another set of promises that the government is stuck with. Um, and it will take a it will take a big shift. And whether we will see that from um, Mr. Sunak or not, I don't know. To say we've got to pause this route, we've got to go down the negotiating route. We can't do that with a threat of this kind and a threat which, in my view, very clearly would involve a breach of international law given, as I said, how utterly unpersuasive I find the argument around, um, around necessity, which I don't, if I'm honest, think anybody in government really believes either. Um, so that's a, it's a kind of fig leaf justifying what otherwise I think would be very clearly a breach. So the government is, is in that kind of schizophrenic state, I think. As uh, someone who's been in charge of defending many judicial reviews over the years, do you have any sympathy with the view that the courts have developed uh, domestic principles of judicial review and of statutory interpretation in a way that has led them too far onto political terrain? Yes, I, I, it's a legitimate question. And of course, judicial review as a, as a construct is, is, is largely judge made. The whole, the whole concept has been developed part of the common law. From time to time, Parliament steps in and adjusts the test or adjusts the rules, and that is legitimate. What I find sort of more puzzling is the way that the, this government has particularly picked on a particular set of cases, and I've mentioned some of them, which, yes, it lost, and it regretted losing, understandably. I mean, I was, as Treasury Solicitor, I think I was acting for the government in all of them. Uh, none of us likes losing cases, um, and it's legitimate for the government to um, regret losing a case, and it's legitimate when the government loses a case for it to ask Parliament to change the law to deal with the, to deal with the outcome. So to take, um, I mean, if government wanted to bring forward a bill codifying the rules on proroguing Parliament, it could have done. It hasn't done that. Because in truth, the argument, the argument is not about broken parliament. It's become an argument about the role of the courts. And similarly, the Evans case, relatively technical case around the scope of the ministerial veto in the Freedom of Information Act. Um, if the government wanted to, it could have legislated to make clear the outcome that it wanted. And, and some of this might have thought it was already quite clear. But to, to make it even clearer what the scope of the veto was and to change the law in that particular case. And that's the kind of normal toing and throwing you see between government and parliament and the courts. 
is that if the courts develop the law in a way that the politicians don't agree with on policy grounds, then they can invite Parliament to change the law. Um, but that hasn't happened in any of those cases. Um, so it's become a kind of a kind of proxy war, um, not about policy or about the outcome of individual cases, but about what the role of the court should be. And that's much more difficult to solve because how, how do you have a blanket test that says the court should only intervene when the government's happy for them to intervene? That can't be the test. Um, so that's where I think we've got into a, you know, a, a slightly unproductive space. But it's a legitimate debate to have, but I'm not sure that we've got a solution to it. Time for one, two, two last questions. At the back and then Master Hawkins. Thank you. Thank you very much for your lecture. I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about the nature of legal advice to ministers and thinking in particular about uh, recent stories about Suella Braverman, what options are left to ministers and civil servants alike when that legal advice is that a course of conduct is likely to be unlawful? So I don't know what advice Suella Braverman's had. I'm not, you know, I'm not there anymore. If I was, I wouldn't talk about it anyway. Um, just a few kind of principles around that. I mean, first of all, we had we, we had, and I think that they still have, a relatively well-developed system for advising on legal risk with a kind of um, codified set of language and tests and so on, so that if you describe something as high risk, you kind of know what you're talking about if something is low risk. And that is very often put in percentage terms. Uh, now, percentages are never precise, but nonetheless, you're giving the best assessment that as a lawyer you can of what the risk is of a particular decision will be found to be unlawful. Um, and it's not improper for ministers, if they've got that advice, even that something is a very high risk, it's not improper for ministers to decide they want to go ahead with it anyway, they take the risk knowingly, they may take steps to mitigate the risk, but in the end, they are prepared to accept the possibility of being challenged if they are, government lawyers will put forward the best possible arguments and the government will live with the result. And that's not an illegitimate approach to legal advice or to legal risk. And it's actually very common that advice is put in that way um, and that there's some legal risk. Most, most very controversial or contentious policies will carry some kind of risk of challenge. That's the nature of complexity of, of, of government and of the law. Um, and even if that risk is high, as I say, it's not necessarily wrong for the government to go ahead. The problem arises if, having tested the advice and possibly sought external advice and so on, nonetheless, it's clear that actually there is no proper legal basis, that something is definitely and clearly unlawful, then you've got a problem. And ministers should not go ahead in those circumstances. And that is relatively rare because policies tend not to be developed if they're plainly unlawful, if they fall away. Um, and that the, in government, the system is that the last word is that of the Attorney General. It's, if, if there's a dispute or something is very, very sensitive, it's the Attorney General who gives the final assessment on whether something is the right side of the line or not. Um, and I simply don't know what would have happened in this case. Um, if an Attorney General has said that something is the wrong side of the line, then really that should be the end of it. The government can't go ahead, otherwise you're, you're facing resignations again, because how could an attorney or, or, or other lawyer live with deliberate decision knowingly to break the law um, on the basis that there's no possible justification? So um, how, how close we've got to that scenario, I don't know, because I don't know what the advice is, but that's the framework. Is there one more, could you say? Or Mr. Hoffman, and Mr. Hoffman, yes. Um, I, I'd like to repeat my thanks for a brilliant lecture, um, not by any means the first dealing with this sort of problem. Um, and my question was going to be a rather wide ranging one. The clink of glasses at the back of the hall suggests to me that I need to keep it concise. So I shall try and do so. Um, would you agree that underlying all this is a very fundamental political question, a political issue which sooner or later is going to have to be resolved. You, you identified, I think, as whether or not we play by the rules 
And um, it seems to me that if there are politicians who are prepared not to play by the rules, that can only be because they think that that is going to be politically acceptable and that one way or another, the public itself is going to have to make a decision as to what is acceptable and what isn't. And if I just add one further thought, isn't there something rather similar happening at the moment in the United States where just 24 hours ago we heard um, a former president, President Obama, uh, saying that truth and logic and democracy, whereas he put it on the ballot, are we not approaching a situation here where we'll be asking our electorate um, to look at exactly the same sort of issue? Well, I think I do agree with that, Stephen. Um, and I've, I've finished my talk with, you know, possibly a slightly tendentious list of areas where I thought the government's conduct was open to question. But I mean, they're all basically true, where the government has in various ways stretched or taken on or seen fit to ignore various codes or rules uh, or, or constraints that would normally apply to it. Um, so I think that I think all those things being true at the same time is quite unusual, even given you know, my long experience and the experience of many people in, um, in this room. It's not that I have some um, rosy glow, a rosy view of a golden age when all politicians were perfect and might have not. But nonetheless, I do think we reached a particular point where um, respect for some of the, for the rules and some of the institutions is at a particularly low point. And um, it would be nice to think that all of this matters enough that it does become an issue at the next election. And again, I'm not kidding myself that, you know, appoint, appointing a, an independent ethics advisor is going to be at the top of a manifesto. But collectively, these things, that there's a moment for a kind of reset where, and Bishu Sunak has kind of said it. I mean, he didn't have to use those words about integrity and accountability and professionalism. Um, so he, he, at some point, he must recognize that these are things that matter. As I've said, what we will now need to do is wait and see whether his actions back up his words. And then when we come to an election, it would be nice to think that some of these issues, governments are allowed to have policies on human rights and judicial review and all those things. But that at the core of it, there will be um, something about playing by the rules, um, respecting independent advice and constraint, not positively trashing it. And in various ways, perhaps, as I've said, are strengthening some of the mechanisms that have become weakened in recent years for achieving that. I think that's it. Thanks. May I, on behalf of all of us, thank Master Jones for a most stimulating lecture. And I can tell you now that three weeks ago when I met him, I asked what he was planning to speak about, and he told me he hadn't written anything because he wanted it to be up to date. <laughs> Uh, when I met him three days ago, I asked the same question and I received the same answer. Uh, well, what we've heard this evening is certainly up to date. It's also been fascinating. Jonathan, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.